Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for i5 for the iPhone is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of i5 for the iPhone is brought to you by iFixit. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy with step by step repair guides, high quality replacement parts, and all the tools you'll need. You'll save $10 off any purchase of $50 or more. Go to iFixit.com slash twit and enter the code i5 at checkout. Hello, everybody, and welcome to i5 for the iPhone, episode 65, Somebody Somewhere is Retiring. This is the show where we scour the App Store, find tips, news, tricks, and goodies, and try to pass them along to you in a way that'll make you say, gosh, they're cool. Number one. So I was all excited to try out this new app called Knock, like K-N-O-C-K, which claims to unlock your Mac via an iPhone app that talks to the Mac via Bluetooth Low Energy, or Bluetooth LE. The idea is that you get close enough to your Mac, let's say your phone's in your pocket or something, and then you just knock twice on your phone to activate knock, which unlocks your Mac. Now, if it works, that's better than a password, right? You don't have to type in anything, you don't even necessarily have to take your phone out of your pocket as long as you can knock it. And the company says that using Knock won't drain your iPhone's battery either, even if you use it all day, every day, because Bluetooth low energy doesn't draw a whole lot of power. But here's why it's really important to read the developer notes before you download apps, especially ones that cost money. Because I did not. If I had, I would have realized that my piece of junk MacBook Air from 2010 is too old to support Bluetooth LE, and I shouldn't have bothered downloading the app, which is $4. And now I need a refund, which Not cannot provide for me. I have to go through the App Store. Now, obviously this company has gone through this with a lot of people, so they've already put together an easy walkthrough process to report the problem to Apple, who in theory should refund me. And I'm told that an iTunes support advisor will contact me within 48 hours. I've never done this before though, so we'll see what happens. Again, this is my fault for not reading developer notes, but I thought I'd pass it along. And obviously I need a new laptop. Number two. Guess what nobody really, really needs? Give up? I'll tell you. Another Twitter app. We've got plenty. However, Tweet Library, which is a pretty advanced Twitter app with things like archiving and collections and filters, might actually be good to have anyway if you find yourself searching for old tweets with any sort of regularity. Tweet Library keeps a searchable archive of your own tweets, your own favorites, your own retweets, so that you can find them later they do easy stuff like filtering by month in the calendar. It adds collections so that you can curate your timeline by organizing related tweets together, and it includes custom filters to automatically group or hide tweets. So when you first install Tweet Library, you can download up to about 3,200 of your own tweets on first launch so that you have a personal archive on your iPhone or your iPad. But you can also import the zip export archive from Twitter, they give that to you free of charge, then load it into your tweet history. It all goes via Dropbox if you have that installed on your iPhone as well. Pretty cool. Tweet Library is also just a regular old Twitter client. Even if you don't care so much about archives, you can have multiple accounts, inline photos, syncing with Tweet Marker, an auto link shortener, all the standard good Twitter client stuff. Although, I don't think I would choose it over something like Tweetbot. It's all tweet history and archiving for $5. So you have to ask yourself, how often do I want access to that vault? Number three, we got an email from Alex in the UK, I believe it's London specifically, who writes, I noticed recently while taking selfies that the front facing camera in the stock camera app and in Snapchat both show a mirrored image as the live viewfinder image. However, the stock camera app and most camera apps will flip the image to save it, which is the true image. Snapchat doesn't change the image after you've taken it though, so essentially all Snapchats taken with the front facing camera are in reverse. I believe this is why Snapchat is so popular. People like seeing a reverse image of themselves as that's the image they see in the mirror and have been used to seeing their entire lives. 
Therefore, people prefer selfies taken on Snapchat to selfies taken in other apps. Will other apps take note of this feature? Well, I think Snapchat is popular because Snapchat is popular, but you have a good point there, Alex. And he's right. Snapchat will keep that mirrored image while the native camera app will revert it to the true image. That may play a small role in why people want to take photos of themselves in Snapchat. Maybe that's why I'm doing it. I don't know. What do you guys think? Is there something to Alex's claim that we're all just a little happier when we see our mirrored selves? This episode of i5 for the iPhone is brought to you by iFixit, an amazing resource. It's probably best known for its teardowns of devices, but it's also an online community with over 10,000 repair guides for everything from your smartphone to your computer, your tablet, your game console, even your bicycle. It's like having free online repair manual for pretty much anything. If you've shattered your iPhone screen or maybe you need to swap out the battery on your MacBook Air, iFixit has you covered. They can hook you up with the parts you'll need to do it and everything they sell is tested and guaranteed. They've got a pro tech toolkit as well. This thing is amazing. 70 tools to assist you with any mod or malfunction or something that has come your way that you need to repair. It's the gold standard for electronics work, from garage hackers to the CIA, even the FBI. But more importantly, their tools are used in service departments everywhere. You've got Phillips bits, small and large electronics, work well with that. Torx and Torx security bits for computers or, or consoles or controllers. Tri-wing bits for video game consoles, even a triangle bit. McDonald's toys use things like this. There really is a tool for everyone. A swivel top precision driver, yep, they've got that too. Lightweight, compact, durable tool roll make it the on-the-go choice for repair professionals and amateurs alike. It's only $64.95 and backed by a one-year warranty. Hobbyists and home DIY fixers also use the ProTech toolkit for eyeglasses, sink fixtures, cabinet doors. Think home improvement. If you're looking for a great addition to an artist or hobbyist tool chest, look no further. Plus, thousands of free iFixit guides help you put your tools to use. Maybe you don't know what you're doing yet? iFixit will help you learn. Holidays are right around the corner, everybody. The Pro Tech Toolkit is the perfect gift for a geek, for a hobbyist, for a DIYer. With iFixit, you can fix it yourself. Visit iFixit.com slash twit for a free step-by-step -step guide. iFixit also sells every part and every tool you'll need. If you enter the code i5 at checkout, you'll save $10 off any purchase of $50 or more. That's ifixit.com slash twit, and we thank iFixit for their support of i5 for the iPhone. Number four. I have a confession to make, and I'm not very proud of myself, but I've been cheating on Siri with someone else. His name is Google Search. I don't really know if it's a gender-based tool, but it's good. You know why I like Google Search so much? Because it's really, really fast, and it works really, really well. It's not even exactly a Siri competitor. That isn't quite fair, so let's talk about why I like it so much. If you have an iPhone 4S or newer, you can now fire up Google Search and say, okay, Google, it's basically saying, wake up, I wanna talk to you. Then it's ready for you. Remind me to call Leo when I leave work. You can tell it to remind you about something, have it notify you when you're supposed to leave for a meeting, let's say. You can see your boarding passes or upcoming tickets, that's part of Google's helpful cards that now has built into search. Google also points out that you can get reminders for all sorts of stuff, even stuff you might not even think you need, but could come in handy. Let's say your favorite musician releases a new album. A uh, TV show has a new episode. Uh, maybe your favorite actor is going to be part of an upcoming summer blockbuster. Okay, Google, what's the name of the mayor of Toronto? Certain politician makes the headlines. You can get notifications for all of that stuff. You just search and press the Remind Me button to customize it for yourself. Plus, Google Search has a simplified homepage and improved voiceover accessibility. The only thing I feel like it can't really do is launch itself. Thank goodness I still have Siri for that. Finally, number five. Here's an app that my colleague Amber MacArthur, she's my co-host on The Social Hour, which records on Fridays. Amber found an app that I also found interesting enough to pass along to all of you. It's called Context, 
which is almost like, what does that even mean? It's sort of an ironic name for a net. But the idea is to reimagine texting with more visuals to give your text context. And by visuals, I mostly mean selfies. The idea is that you compose text message as you normally would to somebody, and then context will attach a photo of you or your surrounding to the message. It could be a one-on-one -on -one text conversation or even a group one. In fact, context seems to emphasize that with groups, it's even more fun. So here's my first reaction to context. Okay, I get it. Messaging apps are all the rage and that's all fine and good, but pretty much everybody I know still uses SMS. That's the texting protocol that is the big, it's, 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 it's a tall order to try to get everybody onto something else. It's gonna be hard for context to get us to start composing our texts within the app. Second, you have to be really careful about the photo that you send. My first couple tries were these really, really unflattering, like, like weird, horrible pictures of my chin, and I didn't realize it was gonna take the picture before I set it up, and I wanted to die because I don't want people to see pictures like that. And context doesn't disappear the way that a bad photo on Snapchat does. You can hold down the photo button for a preview before you actually send a photo, but it took me a little while to figure that out. And then there's the whole, do we really want visuals baked into our text conversations all the time? If not, there's really no reason to use context. I don't want to be unsupportive of the future of communication or anything. I'm just not sure that this is it. Hey, do you ever hear or see a great app or trick on i5? I know the answer is yes. And you want to go back over it or pass it along to a friend? Just hop over to our show notes at twit.tv slash i5. That's where our links live. Also where you can subscribe to the fine show with the feed of your choice. Watch some of our videos again. Maybe episode 47 was just so good. You've got to go back to it. I get it. If you have feedback for us, email us at i5 at twit.tv, leave us a voicemail at 614 on i5, or send us a video with an app review of your own. I'm Sarah Lane, this is i5 for the iPhone, and we'll see you all next week.